Well, um, thank you, Kate, for the invitation and Bill. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you folks. Um, I just wanted to tell you up front, I mean, this is, I've taught a lot of beginner beekeeping classes and this is not a beginner beekeeping class because they take three days, you know, 16 hours of lecture um, and hands-on. This is more just kind of to try to wet your whistle and give you guys an idea of some things that you should do um, if you want to consider keeping bees on your property. Um, so um, I'll just tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, I have my own bee business, run about 250 colonies for honey production and pollination in Southern New Jersey. I live down in the Vineland area and my education's in animal husbandry. I went to Delaware Valley College, now Delaware Valley University, um, and was in the in a animal husbandry major. But my father was a beekeeper from the time I was about 10 years old. And we kept a couple of hives in our backyard in the suburbs of Philadelphia. So that's kind of where my beekeeping roots were, were formed. Um, in my career, I started keeping bees and became a sideline beekeeper. So I had a full-time job with the New Jersey Department of Agriculture and kept bees, uh, colonies of honeybees on the side. And my friend, Bob Harvey, who was a large South Jersey beekeeper would give jobs to me, pollination jobs that were too small for him to do. So that started back in around the late eighties. And so I developed this sideline business as a beekeeper and as a pollinator. I was a past president of the New Jersey Beekeepers Association, that's the NJBA, um, past president of the South Jersey branch of the Beekeepers Association. Um, in 2019, I retired as the New Jersey State Apiarist, position I held for about um, 13 years. And I was an instructor for the beginner beekeeping class at Rutgers University, the three-day short course for about 10, 12 years, um, taught thousands of people through that course with my friend Bob Hughes. Um, I also taught a semester-long apiculture course at Rutgers University for about four years as a part-time lecturer. And once I retired, ran about 250 colonies for a pollination and honey production. And I've also been to Malawi, Africa about six times. I teach beekeeping to subsistence farmers over there through an organization called Villages and Partnership. So that's kind of, my life really has been beekeeping for about the last 30, 35 years. It's uh, something I started out with just like you would probably start out with uh, two or three colonies in my backyard. And um, this social insect just totally fascinated me. And um, it just amazed me the things that they do. So that's kind of who I am and where I've come from. You know, and actually when, when you think of the word bee, a lot of people think of yellow jackets, wasps and hornets as bees, but they are not bees. Um, in New Jersey, we have bumblebees, we have solitary bees and native bees. Honeybees are the bee that I'm interested in and they are not native to America. They were brought here by the, the colonists from Europe and they are a social insect that is manageable. Um, here's a picture of me putting a bee beard on my son at a, um, at a festival we were at and the bee beard the reason we do this is just to show people, if you understand the biology of honeybees, you can work with them rather than fight against them. My son wore that bee beard and I put bee beards on many people um, with virtually no stings whatsoever because we understand the way this insect works and why they do what they do. So why do people keep honeybees? This is very interesting to me. And, you know, I'm not really sure where you are at on these lists, but some people keep them like me for pollination. Some people keep them in their backyards just for their garden. And oftentimes I would run into people who would call me up and say, hey, Tim, I'd like to find a beekeeper that would put two hives in my backyard because my garden's not very productive. Okay. So we know that honeybees pollinate crops 
They transfer pollen from one flower to the other, and they can improve the quality and the quantity of those crops. But they also have a really great effect on wildlife. Having pollinators in your area will help the food that wildlife eat, such as um, acorns, nuts, um, hollies, different plants like that, that honeybees work that produce seeds and fruits that wildlife eat. Another reason people keep bees is honey production, because that's why my dad got into it, because sugar was through the roof back in the 70s, and um, he wanted to have his own honey. He always ate honey. He was a Pennsylvania Dutchman. If he could raise his own, why would he buy it from somebody else? So honey production was mainly why my dad got into it. Mental health, actually Lorenzo Langstroth, who was the founder of modern beekeeping, suffered from mental health problems. And beekeep, honeybees is kind of what saved his life. So it has a calming effect on some people. Many times I would visit beekeepers in North Jersey who would have uh, a chair right next to their beehive in their backyard. And they worked in New York City somewhere on a high stress job, had to commute. They'd get home, they'd grab a beer or an iced tea, and they'd go out and sit next to their bee eyes and just listen to the bees, watch them work, smell the smells coming out of the hive, and just had a very, um, a very calming effect on people. Um, educational, you know, honeybees are a social insect, and watching how they interact with each other and with their environment uh, can be very educational. Um, Medicinal benefits. I've known many people that had allergies or MS or arthritis that would use products from the beehive as well as bee venom therapy to help them combat these issues. I've already talked to you about the environmental benefits through wildlife, and it's just a fun hobby. A lot of times people would take some of the classes I taught who were dads and moms that wanted something fun to do as a family with their kids, like a family hobby. So those are some of the reasons that I've run into why people keep honeybees, okay? So I know, I've known people that just bought the equipment, bought the bees, put the bees in the box and thought that was it. That's all they had to do. And I would say that those people tend to be very I tend to have a high failure rate, I'd say. So um, that would not be the way I would recommend you get started. I would recommend you take a beginner beekeeping class. Most of the 10 chapters of the New Jersey Beekeepers Association offer a beginner beekeeping class. And uh, you could Google search it. You could go to their social media pages. Um, you could go to the New Jersey State Beekeepers website and find out information about these classes and sign up to take one. So that would be probably the first important thing you could do. Most of them have Zoom classes now. Some of them are having are starting to have in-person classes or in-person meetings. So those would be, um, that would be really my first go-to. Second would be some land grant colleges do them online now as well, where you can go and learn about biology, learn a little bit about diseases, um, those sort of things. Um, I'm a DelVal graduate, um, Delaware Valley University, I know does some classes in the summertime on queen rearing and beginner beekeeping. Um, so a beginner beekeeping class, very important. I've known many people that took them two and three times they take a beginner beekeeping class because it's almost like so much information compacted into a few days that you can't process it all. So getting refreshers is also a good idea. The next bullet would be to join the New Jersey Beekeepers Association. Join one of the, the chapters. And that's really where you're gonna learn a lot. They, some groups have, there's 10 chapters of the New Jersey Beekeepers Association. I'm involved in the South Jersey chapter. We, in the summertime, even last year, had some in-person meetings where people would open up beehives, take out frames, show you what eggs look like, what the queen looks like. You know, that hands-on, I'm a hands-on learner, and that's one of the, the ways I learn the best. Um, reading a book is, does not really work that well for me, just reading a book by itself. But joining a chapter, attending the meetings, um, 
and, and you're going to learn a lot of different stuff. There's also two periodical magazines that come out on a monthly basis. One is called Bee Culture. The other is American Bee Journal. And they generally have a mixture of beginner articles as well as more advanced beekeeping articles. They also have a whole bunch of advertisements of sources to buy beekeeping equipment and things associated with beekeeping. So those would be a couple of uh, some good resources for you. Um, edu educate yourself. Um, you know, it's, this is, this will be a lifelong process. I was telling uh, Kate yesterday when we spoke, you know, I've been keeping bees a heck of a long time and I still learn stuff that I did not know about this insect and or things have changed within um, the beekeeping world. For instance, 25 years ago, we did not have this parasitic mite called the Varroa mite. And that came here from Asia and forever changed the face of beekeeping really worldwide. Um, so different things like that are things that you need to continue and you'll do it over the course of your life. When you first start out beekeeping, you have a very steep learning curve. Um, there's a lot of information and a lot of vocabulary that you're not really going to understand. Um, and um, learning those things and being exposed to those things on a regular basis are going to help you better understand what's, what's going on. Um, there is a calendar that the New Jersey Beekeepers Association sells for $10 a year. And it goes month by month um, through the calendar year as to reminding beekeepers of things they should be thinking about, things they should be considering during each month, as well as interesting charts like the larval development chart you see in this slide, um, different ways of feeding bees. And it's something that, that helps to benefit the association and has jam-packed information in it. This calendar I developed um, on my vacation about eight years ago, I, I wrote this and got it edited and printed by all people that are part of the New Jersey Beekeepers Association. Um, and it's what prompted it was many people would tell me, well, Tim, I never, I never put my honey supers on till, till, uh, June. And cause I just couldn't remember what we learned about when to put them on. Well, the calendar tells you when to put them on. It tells you when to, look for disease. It tells you when to test for varroa mites. So that will help educate you in kind of a rudimentary way as well. You see, understanding the language of beekeepers. Beekeepers talk about supers and frames and combs and larva and pupa, and you may not understand those terms. Um, there is a glossary of terms in that calendar as well, and you can Google search glossary of terms for beekeeping and begin to learn some of this lingo that you're gonna need, even to communicate with a mentor or to communicate with another beekeeper. Um, the three books that I would highly recommend, um, not in any particular order. I actually, the one I would recommend the most would be the last one, The Beekeeper's Handbook by Diana Samatero. Uh, Diana was a bee researcher um, and a professor and, she has a lot of sketches that she did. She's a very good artist, um, drawings of different components of a beehive with very um, easy to follow um, um, explanations of different things that a beekeeper would do over the course of a year. Um, I'd highly recommend that book. And there is some more scientific stuff in there. The Hive and the Honeybee by Daydant was written and updated like 30 times. Um, Charles Daydance, one of the founders of modern beekeeping in the United States. And um, this goes by topic by topic. Um, and then the ABCs and XYZs of bee culture is more of an encyclopedia. So if you said, well, I want to know all I could know about propolis, you could look it up in there and read an article or a chapter about propolis. So those would be three books that I would highly recommend you could get and you could spend some time in and it would, um, would help you gain a greater knowledge of the colony and the ongoings inside of a beehive. Uh, beginner beekeeping classes, I mentioned that. These are, I, I started looking a few up and put some dates down here. 
Um, they're kind of all different, um, but really you just need to either, if you can't find the information, uh, if you went to the New Jersey Beekeepers website, you could send an email to the president of each chapter or your chapter and find out when their meeting is going to be. Um, I would tell you, look down there, reserve your spot as soon as you can in January, because sometimes these classes fill up pretty quick. And um, most classes occur in the winter to early spring. So just keep those things in mind. And I would strongly recommend you get involved in one of them. You're going to need to get some equipment. And this is some of the most important equipment that you would have or that you would need. Number one is a smoker. Honeybees communicate through pheromones they release from their body and they release an alarm pheromone. And the reason that a beekeeper can work bees like this with no veil is because they understand the proper use of a smoker. And all this is is a bellows with a, a firebox where you can make a cool, smoky um, situation and that smoke is used to calm the bees and keep them from communicating alarm odor. Um, so another thing is a hive tool, which is like a miniature pry bar. I don't have a picture of that in this slide. I thought I did, but then a veil. These students here were students of mine in an apiculture class. And you see they have a veil on just to protect their face and their eyes um, against a possible bee sting if one of them got upset, okay? Um, learning how to use each of these tools, you'll learn them if you attend meetings or go to an in-person beginner beekeeping course. You would learn how to properly use these, hopefully. Smoke is the most important thing. Too much smoke is as bad as not enough smoke. Okay, I've had people tell me, well, I don't believe I should use smoke because it's not natural to a beehive. Well, you know what? If you want to fight the bees all the time, then don't use smoke. And number two, people would tell me, um, like my, 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 my beekeepers in, in Malawi, Africa, they're afraid of the bees. So they use so much smoke that it just makes the bees totally angry and it defeats the purpose of the smoke. So understanding that equilibrium is an important concept to grasp, but it's gonna take time for you to grasp it. Cost of equipment, this would be a hive setup here. I hope you can see my cursor. There's a bottom board, there's two deep boxes, there's 10 frames in each box, there's a queen excluder, and then there's two honey supers, which are mediums, 10 frames in each of those boxes, and an inner and an outer cover. Just to buy that without the bees costs about $300 new, okay? To buy this setup, all right, the hive equipment, along with a nucleus of bees, which is living bees. It's a small colony of five frames. They cost about 180 to 200 bucks. A veil, a smoker, a hive tool, gloves, feeder, and 25 pounds of sugar to get started costs about 600 bucks. So I want you to guys to just remember that there is a considerable amount of expense uh, put into this to get started which is why you really need to go into it with your eyes open and you need to um, be involved with other people that can mentor you and coach you along. Um, YouTube is not the best place to learn uh, the ins and outs of beekeeping. You can learn some good stuff in there, but you're gonna learn some not that great stuff because anybody can post whatever they want on, on um, YouTube. So, um, you know, and not all of it's relevant to keeping bees in New Jersey. For example, a coach or, a, or a, a YouTuber from Florida, the way they manage honeybees down there would be different than the way we would manage them up here. So just keeping those things in mind, I'm not saying not to go there and check that stuff out, but I'm just saying to understand that not everything is applicable um, in New Jersey. So I would strongly recommend you start with two hives. Um, and the main reason is it kind of doubles your expense going in, but it gives you something to compare one to. You're not gonna know if your colony is behaving normally unless you have something to compare it to, uh, especially when you're in the beginning of your learning curve. So starting out with two is a very wise thing. 
The other reason I would recommend that is if one of them had a queen failure or had some kind of a problem, an experienced beekeeper could patch that hive up for you with resources from the other hive, as long as it was queen right and growing well and healthy. So those are some reasons that I would recommend always starting out with two. The other thing that you can see here is both of these are setups, um, are, um, are on the ground. And th these were overwintered colonies. A new colony would not need this many honey supers, but these colonies were in a good location and overwintered and needed plenty of room to store that extra food. I want you to look at my friend, Elmer. He is standing there with bare feet, swimming suit on, right next to two active beehives. Those bees don't care anything about him. Okay, he's not touched, well, he is touching the hive, but um, he's really not bumping it or working it. And he's not standing in front of, in their flight path. So those bees are flying in and out, gathering pollen, nectar, water, and propolis, and they don't really care a lick about him. So um, just something most people don't know. How do honeybees behave? This is important. They are, one of the things I love about honeybees is that they are happy or content when they're working. We live in a, in a time where a lot of people are only happy and content when they're not working but honeybees are happy when they are working. Um, so that's one of the things I really like about them. They all work for the success of the hive. I love that fact. Um, they are, the individual is not nearly as important as the hive. And that's kind of the way people in Malawi think when it comes to their village. The village is more important and the people in the village than one individual person in the village. Um, so honeybees kind of behave that way as well. They all work for the success of the hive. They will sting to defend themselves or to, to defend their hive. Okay, so they definitely have a sting, but honeybees, once they sting, they, they will die. Um, so they really don't wanna do it unless they're defending either themselves or their hive. They communicate through odors and vibrations. And that's important to know. That's why the smoker is so vitally important when working honeybees. And as I said there, it's the most important tool. So this is how I, I would normally work, understanding the correct use of smoke, et cetera, et cetera. I prefer not to use a veil just because a lot of times you're working bees, it's hot, humid, and stuffy. I would not recommend that for a beginner or a person just starting out, um, but it is possible. That's why it's, that slide is in there. Um, and Quite frankly, I was hired by a past state apiarist named Jake Mathinius. And if you couldn't work bees without gloves, then you couldn't work for him. So I learned that from an early, from an early age. In my early 20s, learned how to work bees without gloves. You have much more, um, you have much better dexterity without a leather bee glove. Um, but it's something that you need to train yourself to grow comfortable with. So this is how I would normally work bees, normally inspect bees for the Department of Agriculture. Unless it was an overcast, rainy, dreary, cold day, I really didn't use a, a veil. Um, but during those times, I certainly used a veil because nobody likes getting stung in the head. How do honey, honeybees impact our environment? They were brought to the Americas in the 1600s. They provide honey, beeswax, pollination for people and wildlife. And I think I already talked about that. The key here is this last bullet. Honeybees are manageable, whereas bumblebees are not really manageable and most um, solitary bees are not manageable. That's why honeybees do such a bulk of the pollination in our country and really in our world. I don't know how many of you realize this, but in, in February, Late January, early February, over half of the colonies of honeybees in the United States will travel to California to pollinate the almond pollination. It'll be like 1.5 million colonies go there for that one pollination or that one crop. And that's the, the almonds in California. Um, and the reason they can do that is because honeybees are manageable. Um, colony is made up of individuals 
but those individuals cannot survive by themselves. An individual honeybee by itself will die shortly. They need each other to survive. There's no individual telling the rest what to do. Most people think because there's one queen bee in the hive that she tells the rest of the hive what to do. That's not true. All she does is lay eggs. And guess what? If she doesn't lay enough eggs, or if they think she's damaged in some way, the, the colony, the workers will make a new queen. Then that queen will kill that old queen and become the new queen of the hive. So um, there's, there's not, it's not a monarchy. Honeybees do what they do as the needs of the colony change. Okay, in the hot summer, more bees will gather water to cool the hive. If there's a nectar flow on in the spring, more bees will gather nectar and store it for a future use. Um, they're very industrious. And some of the researchers have, have called a honeybee colony a super organism. And, and they describe it like this. The bees in a, in a colony are like the cells in your body. You know, your cells all have different functions, but they work together to make you who they are. And the individual bees within a colony, they each have functions that change over time, but they're all working together to keep the colony strong and healthy. Some cool things that honeybees do is they will sacrifice themselves for the colony. For example, the sick will fly away and die. So they don't die at the colony. They'll sting, they'll kill themselves by stinging an invader or a mouse or an intruder or a hornet um, to protect the hive and then they'll die. In the winter time, worker bees share their food with their sisters. So they will share their food until there's no food left to share and then the entire colony will starve to death, will, will starve to death together. So they communicate, um, they can communicate nest site location, and they can decide as a whole which location is the best for the colony. And they can also locate food sources up to three miles away, come back to the colony, trans uh, tell the other uh, worker bees where that food source is, give them a taste of it, and they will go out and, and continue to bring it back. So those are some very cool things, in my opinion, that honeybees do. They also swarm, which is a method of reproduction. And it's not the swarm like the bee movie from the 70s, where the swarm comes and attacks the car and suffocates the engine. Um, this is when the colony gets too crowded. Uh, the workers will make new queens, and then the old queen will leave with about half or a little more than half of the workers and start a new colony somewhere else. And that is the way that the superorganism reproduces themselves over time. Um, they pollinate. And I, one of the reasons they're such good pollinators is because, as I've already said, they're manageable. They're movable, meaning I can pick up a hive in the evening after dark when they, when they come home to their nest or to their hive, pick it up, move it 10 miles away or 1,000 miles away, and they'll fly out the next day orient themselves to the area and start pollinating plants or crops in that area. They have lots of foragers, 30 to 40,000, and they have hair all over their body. And those are the things that allow them to be good at pollination. This is the number one enemy that the honeybee faces. Um, this is the biggest problem within the beekeeping industry. And if you're considering getting involved in beekeeping, this parasite um, is going to be your biggest nemesis. It's called a Varroa mite and it's public enemy number one for beekeepers. This tiny little parasite, it reproduces. Um, it's an external parasite, feeds on the bee's blood, reproduces on the pupae. This is a, a pupa, a drone pupa. And it's very vulnerable. It has thin skin there. There in that stage, it's full of juice. And this mite, this female mite will go into the cell. When that cell is sealed, she will start laying her eggs. And those eggs will hatch out. And the nymphs will feed on this pupa while it's developing. Um, so it's, uh, it's just a very, it causes that pupa to be born 
uh, with potentially uh, viruses, a weakened condition, not properly developed, um, and um, and just will not live as long as an adult bee should live in order to keep the proper balance within a colony. Here are some cool slides that a friend of mine shared with me. This is a comb that has the drone or the pupa opened up. And you can see here's two adult females inside this cell. And here's one up here. Um, and this is the wax cells where the bees raise their young and store their food. Okay, so that's the Varroa. And here's one I'll show them to you on their body. Usually they prefer to be on the belly of the bee, but you see this shiny thing that I'm pointing to, that is a Varroa mite, that is a Varroa mite, um, there's a Varroa mite. So these were very heavily, heavily infested. Um, so let me see. So to be a success, to be successful at beekeeping, you know, you really, you're going to have to become a good mite manager and you're going to learn that through your beginner beekeeping classes, through your periodicals and through attending local beekeeper meetings. When I was a state apiarist, one of the things I spent a tremendous amount of time it doing is educating beekeepers about how to be good mite managers. Um, if you are not successful at that, you are not going to be successful at beekeeping. Be in order to be successful at beekeeping, you need to be observant. You've got to be able to um, see what's going on. I had a professor in college, um, livestock breeds and judging, and he said, it is not enough to look, you must see. It is not enough to listen, you must hear. And that has stuck with me for 40 years. And it's the same with beekeeping. You've got to be able to look at this colony and see what's going on in there and make decisions based on what you see. Okay, so you've got to be observant. You need to like to work because the work isn't getting done if you're sitting home watching TV or playing on your phone. You've got to be out there with them and you've got to be periodically opening up the colony and seeing what's going on inside. You cannot make decisions, management decisions on a honeybee colony by watching them from the outside. It's just not gonna work. You need to continue to learn and hone this art because you're not gonna pick it all up real quick. It's gonna take a constant repetition. My mentor, Jack Mathinius, uh, who was incidentally the New Jersey State Apiarist for about 45 years. He was the third state apiarist since the turn of the century and held that position for about 45 years. And um, he, he always said that when you gave presentations, you needed to repeat things. People needed to hear things six, seven, eight times before they started to remember them. So you, as you continue to learn, you're going to need to hear things over and over and over again so that you remember them. So just keep that in your mind. And you must think and ask questions in order to be successful. Um, it, I've, I've told people many times that beekeeping is a thinking person's um, hobby or business. It's not for, um, for people that don't want to think. So just... Uh, that, that's my email address. I know Kate will share the slides at the end, um, but I wanted to just mention a couple things about Malawi and some of the things I've done there. As long as I have time, Kate, are we good for that? Yes, you're doing great on time. We will have plenty of questions though. <laughs> okay, that's, that's fine. We'll handle them. Okay. So, you know, in 2013, I was asked by one of my students if he was, take, he was taking a group of veterinarians to Malawi, Africa. Well, I didn't know where Malawi was. So I, I put this slide up because maybe you don't know. Malawi is in Southern Africa. It's a landlocked country surrounded by Mozambique. If you're in the tropical fish, I'm told many of the tropical fish that are, that are sold in aquariums throughout the world come from Lake Malawi. But it's very poor. It's about the fourth poorest country on planet Earth. Okay, here's a close up of it. Um, Blantyre is where we fly into. And the beekeepers I work with are in the southern part of Malawi, south and east of Blantyre. 
It's about 26 villages that I'm involved with there. Um, so here's just a shot. This was one of the first times I was there. Um, working bees, they're all kept in top bar hives. We're, we're transitioning some into Langstroth hives now, but top bar hives is, is the way they go because it's warm all year round there and because they really have no resources to do, to do any better than, than that type of beekeeping. Um, Malawians are very much afraid of the bees. Uh, the Afri this is the African bee. It's much smaller than a European bee, which is what we would keep in New Jersey. And it's noticeably different. And, um, you know, I have my, I have my bee suit on because I wasn't really sure what I was going to run into. And this is, um, you know, they were, they were manageable if you use smoke correctly. Here's another shot with some of my beekeeper friends over there um, learning. It, the reason that they're interested in beekeeping is honey is very much in demand. And for someone who's a subsistence farmer, selling a honey crop makes a significant difference in your family's finances. So um, that's another reason. Here was a hive that was rotted because you see this is all rot down here because the lid was not kept maintained well. And we transferred these bees into this box that day. Um, they're kept in these long Langstroth boxes. So, I mean, long, um, not Langstroth, long um, top bar hives. So this is the organization I go there with, Villages in Partnership. We're planning a trip in early 2022. And that will be the third group of beekeepers I've taken to Malawi and about my seventh uh, trip there. I love the people, they are friendly, they're looking for information and they want to improve their life and they're hard workers. Um, and I just, I love everything about going there and, and, and the people. So um, that might be the last one. Oh, I just reiterate these items to be a successful beekeeper and my email address. And I think the last, that's the end of it, Kate. Fabulous. Thank you, Tim. Sure. We have a few questions already in the chat and I welcome anyone else to include their question in the chat or um, when we finish these questions, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and ask. Um, the first question is, if honeybees are not native to the United States, then what was your pollinating plants before them? Yeah, it was mostly um, native bees, bumblebees and solitary bees, but none of those bees produce honey. The reason that our forefathers brought honeybees over was so that they had a source of a sweetener. Because back when they came here, there wasn't even sugar. There wasn't sugar cane. Um, you know, and that's really the main reason they brought them here was not so much for pollination, but for producing wax for candles and honey for food, for a food sweetener. Tim, I see we've got another good question here is where's the best place to situate a hive? shelter, sun, et cetera. Yeah. If you're sizing up your property, where would it be? That's, that's a great question. And I should have included that in here, but you want it on the South side of a, of a, of a, of a woods, a hedgerow, a building where it's protected to the North and West. And you want full sun exposure for as many hours in the day as possible. Honeybees are very good at cooling their hive but they don't start working until their temperature gets up to a certain temperature. So you want them to get going as quick as possible. And you also wanna take into account trees because even in the winter time, if the trees lose their leaves, it's still 10 to 15 degrees cooler under dispersed shade from a tree with no leaves than it is in the full sun. Excellent. Um, the next question is, how much space do you need in your yard? You don't need much space. I've seen people keep them. A honeybees, a honeybee hive, two honeybee hives take up, you know, four square feet at the most. Um, so as long as it's not in a place where their flight path is going to be over your neighbor's backyard um, or, um, um, you know, bothering your family when they're coming out of your house. You know, my parents lived on a 50 by 110 lot in suburban Philadelphia, and we had five or six hives there in the backyard 
at the back end of that 110 foot lot with shrubbery around it. So the bees flew up and out. They didn't fly over our neighbor's yards and it was, it was really no problem whatsoever. Tim, along those lines, here's another question. Are there any permissions or anything required to keep a hive on your property? In New Jersey, there were regulations passed um, just before or shortly after I retired that um, it says that people cannot prohibit you from keeping bees, but you're limited on a quarter acre lot of no more than three colonies of bees. Um, and you obviously need to have them set back from your neighbor's property line, a certain distance, or a flyway barrier, they call it, so the bees fly up before they fly out. A flyway barrier could be a fence, could be a garage or a building, um, could be some, some trees, um, anything like that to force the bees to fly up before they fly out. Are you, I guess there's a follow-up. Are you required to register the hive? like with a department or? Yeah, in New or... Jersey, you're required to register your apiary with the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. Okay. And you're also required under these new regulations to take a, um, a beginner beekeeping class within the first year of you starting a beekeeping, uh, keeping bees. Just so that you have some education and understand their behavior and how to properly work a colony without getting it um, all irritated and inflamed. We have a question, um, someone asking about a more established hive. Would you recommend splitting the hive in the spring to prevent them from swarming? Or what is the follow-up practices after your first year of having bees? Well, after your first year, you would obviously want, you could split them if they were very strong. Once again, you're going to learn that not so much through a, through a, through a, a beekeeping class, but through working with a mentor or working with your local chapter of the Beekeepers Association um, to learn what is the good strength of a colony to split um, and when to do that split and how to do that split. Um, so yeah, but not every colony gets split, you know, in the spring. Many times they just get supered up, um, meaning adding honey supers to them early enough so that they don't really develop a good tendency to want to swarm. Here's another so good much one. to learn. <laughs> yeah, here's another good one for you. Um, requirements for water sources. Are there any or should, any considerations? Yeah, water source is one of the most, is one of the leading. Lack of a, of a good water source is the major cause of, or probably one of the top two causes of problems with your neighbors. If your neighbors have a swimming pool that they spent 20,000 bucks for, so that their kids or their grandkids can come over to their house and swim and your bees are drinking at that pool and those kids won't go out and swim in it, your neighbors are not gonna like you at all, I'm telling you. And the thing that most people don't realize is honeybees start gathering water in February on warm days to thin the honey in the hive and feed it to the babies as they start to develop. So. Once those bees orient on that water source, until it dries up, they're not gonna change and look for another one. And you can't get them to leave that water source. So it's so important to have your water source out and available in early February, so that your bees orient to that rather than to the top of your neighbor's pool with all the leaves and the crap that accumulated on top of the cover, because bees love to drink in a place like that. So it's definitely something you need to consider. You need to have a water source. And the thing that I would run into when I was a state apiarist is people would let them run dry when they went on vacation um, in the summertime and it's hot as hell out. And then the bees reorient to your neighbor's pool and there's nothing gonna change until it stops, until it starts raining again and they can get water elsewhere. So yeah, that can be a real problem, keeping them in a neighborhood. It's not really a problem keeping them on a farm. Sure. Um, we have a question about the specific types of honey, like lavender honey or blueberry, clover. Um, how are those produced? Yeah, some beekeepers will um, put their colonies, say, on a blueberry field uh, for pollination, and they've, har they've harvested all the honey before they put it there. And then they harvest whatever honey is in the honey supers after it's removed from there. 
and they would call that blueberry honey. Is it 100% blueberry honey? Well, probably not if it was put on a smaller blueberry farm up in Burlington County, like New Lisbon, Pemberton, someplace like that. But if it was put on a farm down in Hamilton, 500 acres of blueberries and the next 500 acres is blueberries and the next 200 acres is blueberries, it's probably mostly blueberry nectar and probably pretty close to what blueberry honey would be. So that's kind of how that's gotten. Um, it, it's never 100%, but it's got a large amount of those crops in it if it's lavender or blueberry or black locust or whatever. Tim, I see a question. How do you address varroa mites? I guess that's one of the biggest issues we're gonna have. Yeah, varroa mites can be controlled through various uh, measures. There is um, primarily they're through um, treatments that are put into the colonies at certain times of the year to knock back the mites. None of these treatments are 100% and they will never eradicate all the varroa mites. For instance, right now, this time of year when it's not too cold, but there's very little brood, oxalic acid vaporization works very well. And a lot of beekeepers are, have just finished doing that or are doing that now. Um, once we get into early spring and we have cool temperatures, there are some products that form a vapor of an acid vapor. For example, um, formic acid or menthol um, and thymol, some other products that vaporize in a colony and that vapor will kill a percentage of the mites. And then there are contact pesticides that are put into colonies on plastic strips. As the bees walk across it, it gets on their hair and it kills the varroa mites inside the colony. So there's, there's various ways of doing it to reduce those numbers. Um, and that's something that you know, your mentor or your more advanced beekeeping class would handle in much better depth than, than we can do in, in a topic like I had today. We have a question about painting the boxes. We saw some boxes with different colors. Um, are there any colors or types of paint that are more desirable reasons for choosing different colors? Used to be, you'd always see honeybees in white boxes just because it kind of reflects the heat or whatever. Um, but people that keep bees in a residential neighborhood like to paint them uh, more of a brown or a green. So they kind of blend into the backyard and don't stand out like a sore thumb there. Um, larger commercial beekeepers will get uh, reject paint from paint stores and Home Depots and places like that. Exterior latex is what most people would use. Um, and just whatever is available, they would, they would get and paint those boxes, mainly just to protect the boxes from the weather. Um, but really the color doesn't matter that much, um, in my opinion, it's really just protecting the wood. <coughs> Excuse me. No problem. Um, okay, we have a little bit of a follow-up question on the painting. Um, so you're saying they, I'm just trying to understand the question. Um, do they have to be painted? They and... don't have to be painted. Some people will clear coat them. Um, some people dip them in, in boiling wax and just leave them natural. The wax gets sucked into the pores of the box and then it pretty much won't rot, won't rot at all. Okay. The person refers to tongue oil or other kinds of oil to treat the boxes with. Yeah, but let's, let's mention to that, that person that um, don't do the inside of the box. You would just do the outside of the box. We pretty much never uh, paint the inside of a bee box or of a bee lid or anything like that. We just want the wood there. The bees will coat it with propolis, which is a resin they collect from, um, from trees and shrubs. <coughs> and that will preserve the inside and make it a very good environment for the bees. The outside, they don't really do anything to so protecting the wood and the lifespan of your bee equipment, it's good to keep it painted on the outside. Hmm. Okay, got a follow-up question for you, Tim, on water source. So if we're starting with that beginner two hive setup, um, how big a wa water source or where would you situate it? I guess how close to the hive? Yeah, like you know what works great for a water source is a bird bath. 
Honeybees like to sit on something masonry, a bird bath in the sun that warms up. The sun hits that masonry, and even in the spring or late winter, the bees can drink slightly warmer water. They like that a lot. Um, and that could be uh, 30, 40 feet away from the beehive. It doesn't have to be right up on the beehive. I've used a mortar pan. You can buy a plastic mortar pan at the hardware store and two bag or at Home Depot and two bags of um, marble chips dumped in there and put it under your downspout. So the downspout keeps it mostly full in this and it's in the sun. So the sun gets on the water, gets on the stones and the bees can crawl down between those stones and drink that water. Mm. That's, that's another little handy one. You don't want it right up on the bees. You kind of want it a little bit away from them in a nice sunny environment. I have a direct um, question from Kara asking about more natural types of water sources like a creek that might be as much as 400 feet away. Um, would you rely on natural water sources or? Natural water sources is fine. The only thing I would be concerned about is if you're living in a um, tight residential community in your neighbors have pools they're not going to fly to a water source 400 feet away if there's a pool 100 feet away you follow what i'm saying yes they'll go people, for the closest they'll go for the closest and most people put pools in a bright sunny place not shaded a lot of water sources are going through shaded areas mm. and are cooler so you know that can be problematic with trying to get bees to orient onto something the other yeah. thing that honeybees really like is salt water pools, ones that use salt water instead of chlorine. So that's another battle to fight. Okay. Um, we have a little bit of a specific question about someone's property that is 50 by 120, so similar to the property you were describing earlier. Um, they do have neighbors, but no pools, and they're wondering if that still seems like not an ideal location, or if there's any um, advice for that specific property to make it feasible to have bees there. Yeah, a couple panels of stockade fence to the north and west to keep, you know, say, six, eight foot. You want it to be over a person's head couple panels of a stockade fence type of a situation. And even you could put a small one in front so that people really can't see what's going on out there. You know, the problem is when your neighbor sees you go out with a full bee suit, like my friends from Malawi were wearing and your gloves and a veil and your smokers going and you're standing there telling them bees won't hurt you. Bees won't hurt you. You know, you're sending a mixed message to them. You follow that? Certainly. <laughs> it looks like you're investigating a nuclear bomb site and you're telling them that they have no risk. Now, <laughs> that, that's why you never see me wear a veil there. I would always go without a veil, work the bees without the veil, without gloves, because I can say to the neighbor, the bees will not hurt you. They're not hurting me and I'm doing all these manipulations with them. You see what I'm saying? So it's you know, you can contra your actions can contradict your words if you're not careful and make your neighbors ill at ease. Absolutely. Um, another question on the water sources. Um, if you have chickens and you've got water for them, will the bees share that? Can they share that? Um, yeah, our, our bees share our chickens water. <laughs> and all we have is the black Fortex tubs. And it's in the same place all the time. The bees drink there. Um, and so do the chickens. It doesn't bother the chickens, doesn't bother the bees. So I have no problem with that. I will tell you that I had a, an old hog trough that used to catch the drips coming out of the spigot. And then we fixed, and, and the bees drank there. It had leaves in it and it was a nasty looking mess, but the bees always drank there. In the hot summer, um, we had gone away and hadn't run that spigot for a while. The whole thing dried up and the bees um, stopped going there and started going somewhere else. And then we could never get them to come back there because they were 
always had water at another place. So it's, it's kind of, you can't just put something out and think they're going to go to it. It's not necessarily true. Tim, I'm going to throw one final question to you. Um, and this one relates to actual honey production. How much honey can you expect to get off from a hive in your first year? Your first year, you probably won't get any because you have to build all your comb. If you're starting with fat wax foundation or plastic foundation, you want to get both of, both of those deep boxes filled out. So the first year, most people will not make any honey. But after that, when that colony overwinters and is big and strong the next spring, that's the year you're going to produce honey. In New Jersey, our, our average is about 45 pounds a year per colony, 35 to 45 pounds a year. I think we've just scratched the surface here, Kate. Absolutely. <laughs> Tim, thank you so much for coming and answering so many questions. Um, definitely been informative and entertaining at the same time. You're welcome. It's a big topic. And it's like I said, you're going to be learning. You're on a steep learning curve. And it's um, you're going to have a lot, lot to work on to really be successful at it. Absolutely.